Jen. Jen. Horses just dropped now that a, a, a vessel has been intercepted in an attempt to illegally enter Australia from Sri Lanka. What do you? What, what's your response to that? Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. And that was our former Prime Minister teeing up Seven's Jennifer Beshwati to ask a bombshell question on Election Day. The Seven reporter had been leaked some hot news that the Coalition hoped would swing the election result. And Scott Morrison, who normally refused to discuss on water matters, was eager to tell all. Well, I can confirm that, uh, that there has been an interception of a vessel en route to Australia. Um, that vessel has been intercepted in accordance with the policies of the government and, uh, and they're following those normal protocols. And I can simply say this, I've been here to stop this boat, but in, in, in order for me to be there to stop those that may come from here, you need to vote Liberal and Nationals today. And in the interests of full transparency, in the middle of an election campaign, the Labor Party was advised of this and a statement has been issued uh, by uh, the Border Protection Authorities. It was a desperate ploy by a desperate government in the final hours of its political life. And as Australians lined up to vote that afternoon, there was a chance it could have worked. And as the PM made his final pitch, there was an 11th hour twist. There has been an interception of a vessel. But the Coalition's efforts to get the message out did not stop there, because two hours after the PM's lunchtime revelations, the Liberal Party was making sure that voters in marginal seats were not missing the news. Liberals have actually just started releasing text messages in seats they need to win. Australia border force has intercepted an illegal boat trying to reach Oz. Keep our borders secure by voting Liberal today. Labor called it disgraceful at the time. And now a report into what took place, as the Sri Lankan boat was intercepted, has revealed how the coalition tried to use the media and public service to cling on to power. With the operation still underway, the Office of Home Affairs Minister Karen Andrews directed Border Force to publish news of the interception, with words to the effect that the Prime Minister wants a statement. The Minister's office also requested the statement be emailed to selected journalists, but the Secretary refused, telling his department the release, once cleared, is to be posted to our news and media site no more and no less. The Secretary being Mike Pazillo, the powerful boss of Home Affairs. So, with the bureaucrats unwilling to leak the news, ministers did the dirty work instead, while the PM mustered the media to respond to the news. But there was one small problem. Three minutes before the PM was asked about the boat's arrival, the statement was still not up on the Border Force website, and politicians were panicking, as you can see from this furious text exchange between the Office of the Minister for Home Affairs, Karen Andrews, and her department. Is it live? PM is speaking. I'm refreshing. So are we. What on earth is the issue? It always takes a few minutes to go live. I have no idea how it works, but we can't influence it. We are calling IT. A lot of people are furious. And two months later, some still are. Releasing the report on Friday, Labor's Home Affairs Minister Claire O'Neill called the incident shameful, disgraceful and without precedent and accused the Morrison government of having... ..sabotaged the protocols that protect Operation Sovereign Borders for political gain. And judging by what had gone before, it certainly did. Here, from 2014, is how Scott Morrison typically dealt with media requests to confirm an asylum seeker boat's arrival. Minister, is there a boat in trouble of Christmas arms? It is our standard practice, as you know, to, uh, under Operation Sovereign Borders, to report on any significant events regarding uh, maritime operations at sea, particularly where there's safety of life at sea issues associated, and I'm advised that I have uh, no such re uh, re reports to provide. Is there a boat? Well, I've answered the question. Morrison was being asked about a boat from Sri Lanka with 153 Tamil asylum seekers seen off Christmas Island. 27 times he declined to confirm the boat's existence or comment on its fate. And his exchange with journalists, of which this is just a part, became increasingly bizarre. There is no such report for me to provide to you today. If there was a significant event happening, then I would be reporting on it. So what does that mean? If the boat well, actually I'm, sinks, I'm, you'll tell us? You're a bright journalist. I'm sure you can work it well, out. No, would you today. clarify, sir, for us, at what point does an event become a significant event involving a boat on the water? When you see me steer, standing and reporting on it. So you and determine... you're standing here reporting? I'm not. Last week, Scott Morrison told churchgoers in WA, we don't trust in governments. You can see why, in his case, that might be good advice. Meanwhile, Seven's Jennifer Beshwati, who asked the teed-up question, has come under savage fire on social media that is really not deserved. 
Most reporters in her position would surely have done just the same. But now, let's get the news on former Foreign Affairs Minister Julie Bishop. So, is she offering her views on China or how to manage the Pacific? Not quite. Former Foreign Minister Julie Bishop and her partner David Panton have called it quits after eight years. David Panton confirmed he called time on the relationship over an Italian meal in Sydney. Yes, Bishop's breakup was news on Nine's 6 pm bulletin. And that wasn't the only place it's been making headlines. Julie Bishop's beau calls time on foreign affair. Former Foreign Minister Julie Bishop emerges after breakup. I'm fine. Julie Bishop speaks for first time on eight year relationship ending. Why Bishop's breakup was such a big story, we're not quite sure. But it wasn't the only news last week about the woman who ran for leader of the Liberal Party in 2018. And once again, it was on Nine's primetime bulletin. Former Foreign Minister Julie Bishop has managed to make eye and ore look glamorous by hosting the Welcome to Company video for new employees at West Australian mining giant Mineral Resources. Ms Bishop tells new staff how to drive, ride or grab the bus to work, how to relax, get a decent brew or gloss up at the office. Yes, from PM to PR. And Bishop had graced the Sunday papers that day too. Awe-inspiring in Perth as one of the stars out to play. Doing a headstand in Sydney and as you've never seen her in Adelaide. And next morning on Nine's Today Show, there she was again, waxing lyrical to Carl Stefanovic about the mining company that had hired her. This work environment is family friendly. They've got a gym and yoga room and, and a creche for the kiddies for pre and post school and a cafe and trained baristas and restaurants. And how much was she paid for spreading all this love? No one in the media had the nerve to ask. And next day, when Bishop popped up again, this time on Tens the Project, a whole lot more questions went unasked. Well, welcome to our guest host tonight, of course, Julie Bishop. Yes, Good to have you with us. Welcome. Thank you. First up on the project was a big story about the shocking state of the environment and how it had got worse with the coalition in power. Australia has lost more mammal species than any other continent. 202 animal and plant species have been added to the threatened list since 2016. And 18 of our ecosystems are showing signs of collapse or near collapse. The State of the Environment report had been released that day and the new Environment Minister, Tanya Plibersek, did not mince words. And on every page, there are stories that talk about how our environment is in a, in a terrible state and actually getting worse. So it's bad and deteriorating. This had happened while Bishop was in government. And after she left, the coalition had sat on the report, as Plibersek told the National Press Club. The previous minister, Susan Lay, received it before Christmas, but chose to keep it hidden, locked away until after the federal election. And when you read it, you'll know why. Now, with that in mind, you'd think the project's regular hosts, Waleed Ali, Gary Bickmore or Peter Hellyer, would want to ask Julie Bishop a question or two. After all, some of the environmental damage occurred while she was deputy leader of the Liberal Party and a senior member of the Cabinet. But no, not a peep. And it was the same a short time later. Refugee Moz Azamadabar's court case against the federal government is now underway. Moz alleges his 15 months of hotel detention in Melbourne was unlawful. Kurdish refugee Moz Azamadabar spent more than six years on Manus Island and in Port Moresby before being detained in Melbourne hotel rooms. And his years in overseas detention happened while Bishop was in office. But the only one on the project to point that out was Moz himself. I see uh, you, uh, Julian uh, Bishop, uh, that uh, when you were um, um, a foreign minister, uh, you and your government locked me up in detention for eight years. And um, uh, I feel uh, very sad, but I don't have hate in my heart. Incredibly, none of the project hosts asked Julie Bishop how she felt about his words and if she felt responsible. But moments later, there was a vigorous debate with Bishop about, well, you can hear it for yourself. Most people think a message is lacking if it doesn't have an emoji. 58% say they're unaware an emoji can have multiple meanings. I mean, if someone sends me a, hey, Julie, check out my um, eggplant, I mean, it's an eggplant, right? Have you ever sent an eggplant to a PM? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I'm the recipient of oh, eggplants. <laughs> I'm not a giver of eggplants. Ah, hilarious, eh? Or perhaps pathetic. 
but also remarkable that sections of the media should give Bishop a free pass and treat her as a newly minted celebrity with no political past. The media have a duty to hold politicians, including past politicians, to account. But now, to the somewhat scary story of an Australian journalist detained by the Taliban in Kabul and how three ridiculous tweets set her free. Tweet an apology or go to jail, said Taliban intelligence. Whatever it takes, they dictated, I tweeted. Lynn O'Donnell has been covering Afghanistan on and off for the last 20 years and is a former bureau chief for AP and AFP. Last week, she went back to Kabul to cover the first anniversary of the Taliban takeover. But she soon found she was not welcome, thanks to stories like these that she'd written while she was out of the country. As Taliban expand control, concerns about forced marriage and sex slavery rise. Millions of Afghans want to flee. LGBTQ Afghans have to. Angry Taliban detained O'Donnell, threatened her and said her articles were full of lies. Reports that I had written for Foreign Policy magazine were fake, that I'd made them up and that the sources that I had quoted didn't exist. The Taliban also demanded names and details of her local sources, something she was never going to hand over. But she didn't want to rot in an Afghan prison, so what was she to do? They wanted me to make my uh, apology, as, it, as they called it, uh, public, and they dictated the words to me and they um, made me send the tweets. And thus, her followers on social media watched in amazement as she took a hatchet to her own work. I apologise for three or four reports written by me accusing the present authorities of forcefully marrying teenage girls and using teenage girls as sexual slaves by Taliban commanders. The Taliban, she told her Twitter followers, would never do such things. And to suggest it was an affront to Afghan culture. In fact, she admitted she had made it all up. These stories were written without any solid proof or basis and without any effort to verify instances through on-site investigation or face-to-face -face meetings with alleged victims. Not surprisingly, these alarming tweets were now causing concern, with one person replying on Twitter... I hope they do not torture you. Luckily, they didn't. And once O'Donnell was safely out of the country, the story of why she had written the tweets made for a terrific column. The Taliban detained me for doing my job. I can never go back. It was, as O'Donnell told the ABC, crazy stuff and the sort of turbocharged publicity that the Taliban was trying to avoid. What the Taliban essentially did when I told them that this was going to make them look silly, they didn't believe me. But what they have done is hand me a global platform to highlight the brutality and the misogyny and the violence of what they call peace. O'Donnell won't be going back, and nor, she says, will most Western journalists, given the Taliban's brutal attacks on the press. Afghanistan's once proud, independent media is no more, and now there's nobody else. The country is descending into a hellscape of terror, hunger and poverty. But who will tell the story? Only the very brave and the foolhardy is the answer. But finally, to football and a media war between pay TV and free-to-air over who gets to show the best games. There are warnings footy fans could be the losers in the next AFL TV rights deal, tipped to be the biggest in the history of Australian sport. Foxtel is now pushing to show even more games on pay television, forcing supporters to fork out for the privilege of watching their team. Yes, it's a free-to-air footy fight that has fans and billionaire media baron Kerry Stokes up in arms. So, what's it all about? Well, it comes because TV rights to AFL from 2025 are up for grabs. And Seven and Foxtel, the current broadcasters, are being pressed to stump up more cash. As The Australian reported last week... One option being discussed is Foxtel gaining rights to show more live matches of the local teams in passionate AFL cities Adelaide, where the Crows and Port are both popular, and Perth, the home of the West Coast Eagles and Fremantle. If that happened, Seven's free-to-air viewers would lose games and have to pay to watch them. Cue outrage on the fans' behalf from Seven News, whose ultimate boss is Kerry Stokes. West Aussies love watching their footy and they love watching it on TV for free. A high arrival bid would force fans to reach into their pockets to see their favourite players in action. Bad news for fans and for Seven and for Stokes. But thankfully, they had Australia's most popular premier on side. It'd be a sad day for Australia if people lost the opportunity to watch the football for free. I strongly urge the AFL to stick with free-to-air viewing of football. And as Perth Mayor Basil Zemplis, also employed by Seven, noted on his Triple M show next morning... 
Well, that's handy for seven. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that's absolutely. And he's right. He's yeah. absolutely right. And that night, Seven News was back on the story with Fremantle coach Justin Longmuir also crying foul. We need to make it really accessible um, to you know, keep the love of the game and, and keep growing the game as much as we can. I agree. Now, next Agreement week, all round. And from a powerful block, the Premier, the top-ranked team and the top-rating TV network. Add in the city's only newspaper, which screeched from page one... Kick in the guts! Out on the full! WA Premier's outcry as Eagles and Dockers fans may be forced to pay to watch teams on TV. The West Australian, of course, is also owned by Kerry Stokes's Seven West Media. And Chief Reporter Ben Harvey advocated going rogue to protect his employer. And if it does turn out that West Australians have to pay to see Freo or West Coast, then every nerd in this state has a moral obligation to pirate the games and stream <laughs> them live. Because paying to watch the footy isn't what this country's about. Yep, positively un-Australian. But at least Harvey admitted who pays for his opinions. Channel 7, which is owned by 7 West Media, which also owns this show, so we have some skin in the game here. No kidding. But when you're trying to pull off a multi-billion dollar sporting deal, why wouldn't you want to have a media army at your back? Fans, of course, will not be complaining. And that's all from us for tonight. There's more on our website where you can stream and download the program. And don't forget Media Bites every Thursday. Until next week, goodbye.